India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi's trip across Africa is expected to attract trade and investments, offering billions of dollars in credit and development financing with an aim to deepen bilateral relations with the 54 African countries, not only economically but also politically. My name is Maggie Mortesi and we are joined by the President of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Rashid Shah. Thank you so much for joining us on CNBC. Hi Maggie, good to be here. I'm going to put down some statistics to help us give us the context of the conversation. Now, trade between India and Africa as of 2015 was at about 70 billion US dollars vis-a-vis trade between China and uh, Africa, which was at 222 billion US dollars. Quite a big number or quite a big gap for India to catch up with China across Africa. But the question is, at this particular time when we see two leaders in Africa, but in this case, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in Rwanda, uh, you know, going to Uganda and visiting various um, uh, African countries. What ultimately does India seek from Africa? Uh, it's an interesting question. But first of all, I think, uh, as you correctly said, the Chinese trade with Africa is about three times India's trade with Africa. But you should remember that Chinese economy is about five times the size of India. So if you adjust for the size of the economy, Africa has a much larger percentage of India's foreign trade uh, out of the total trade we do. So for India, given the historic ties we have had with Africa, uh, you know, India, Indians have come to Africa, India has been doing business with Africa for hundreds of years. So given that, I think these ties are still strong, growing well, and as India grows, and as Africa grows, because Africa is also on a fairly high growth trajectory now, I think both our countries, uh, uh, India and the continent of Africa, all the countries of Africa, we can grow together in a more efficient manner and actually build on each other's growth. From India's, uh, from India's point of view, what are we looking from Africa? Obviously, we are looking at business opportunities, investment opportunities, trade opportunities. There are a lot of bilateral ties. The comfort is there, the historic ties, the cultural ties are there. But the idea now is how do we grow this further and what role India can play in this phase of Africa's growth, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in technology, because a lot of countries like um, countries in East Africa, like countries like Rwanda, what you are going through is also a story India has gone through and India is also going through. So there are so many similarities between the growth phase that India has gone through in the recent past and India is going through and what countries in East Africa are going through, that I think there is a huge amount of comfort, synergy, and familiarity that we can exploit. The current trade between India, India and Rwanda has just crossed about $100 million, but I think the opportunity is close to $1 billion. Uh, in our Indian delegation this time, we have more than 100 people. It is one of the largest Indian delegation that has come here. And uh, already a lot of MOUs are signed. There are a lot of investments in infrastructure, in rail lines, in real estate. All of that are being proposed as of now. And I think lastly, I would say the Indian delegation has come here not looking for only business opportunities, but is looking for business friendship. Uh, quite important when you mentioned that you know the, the two continents, of course, the countries have had um, great relations in the past, culturally, you know, from colonization. We share a lot of things together, you know, and there's been this gap in terms of trade. Of course, we've seen new players come into the market, like China, for example, three times big the kind of investment you have on the African continent. Now that you're reviving the relationship with the African continent, we should say, what are some of the things that you need to do to revive this and what's the strategy now? I'm not sure whether we are reviving because I think the ties were always there and we should accept China is a large country is now the second largest country in the world from a GDP point of view from a purchasing power point of view it's the largest country in the world from uh, purchasing power GDP so China will always be there I don't think India is competing with China because I think in most of the places it will be India and China because I think there is the world is very large for a lot of opportunities in that. Maybe I we should ask where, is in, where has India been failing in the past and where has China been succeeding in the past? 
as i said i think the fact that india has already grown the trade quite a bit yeah as itself been a big achievement can we grow even further and i think the area that we need to do a lot more i must say is make investment from india into africa i think historically india's uh, relationship with africa especially east africa was more around trade we used to export from india maybe we imported a little bit you know things like agri goods and pulses from east africa but they were not strong investment ties last few years we are seeing that indian companies are investing outside but i would also say that this is not just with africa a lot of indian companies only in the last few years are now getting comfortable and going out and making investments in other countries so we have always seen that first it starts off with a lot of trade then it gets converted into investments and then the investments grow into even more broader you know ties on socio economic stuff including visa regime and ease of doing business for the countries with each other all that grows yeah. so i think india is at the phase where we are shifting from just trade only to trade and investments and i think in investments also we are currently making uh, tr- um, making trade investment making business investments eventually india will also be a financial investor in africa so i think that's a evolutionary path we are going through and i don't think there is any india china element to that this is just india's evolution yeah. africa's evolution and they are co- coinciding at this point of time now i want to quote uh, some indian officials of course uh, this is not the first trip uh, prime minister narendra modi has done across africa in the past in 2016 he did a trip uh, across uh, in kenya south africa and uh, mozambique but the officials came out to say that um, india's approach to africa is non exploitative we're looking at 84% of uh, imports um, uh, of of india from africa you know uh, being uh, in this in this in this sense of raw materials well one would say uh, what what did what does this statement mean vis-a-vis the report of brooklyn's that actually comes out to say that 84% of this has actually been uh, raw materials that india is getting from africa china of course in the past has been criticized of uh, taking a lot of raw materials from africa do i just want to hear your thoughts on this is this I the kind I of direction I, I, i don't want to make this india versus china okay. approach okay. because this is not truly india versus okay. china i think india yes india imports raw material from china but you know what uh, i'm also reminded that india has had the same issue india has over the years been a raw material exporter and that is true with most emerging countries whether you are petroleum producing or you are producing agri goods most emerging countries are initially exporting raw material as you develop your country as you develop the infrastructure and the industrial capability of your country you start doing more value added i think india has gone through that phase in fact i would say india is also going through that phase we have this entire uh, you know program around make in india yeah. and the last part of make in india is we export cotton can we convert cotton into fabric into textiles into yeah. garments into apparel and export that that has been india's journey over the last few years the same thing has been true with many other goods including agri goods we want to move away from exporting uh, agri like india is one of the large exporters of of you know goods like rice we want to do value added stuff we want to do agro processed so india is also going through the same journey yeah. and in fact the similarities between africa and india in terms of how we can do more value added more you know industrial activity in our own countries rather than just be a raw material exporter is a very common theme for all of us and i think even in that india's journey itself is an example and a lot of indian companies who have done that in india which is help convert raw material into finished goods and export those those are the companies now wanting to come here make the investments the as i said earlier india is shifting from seeing africa as a trade partner to an investment partner now something you mentioned that was quite interesting is the the large number of, of the private sector that uh, Pr- uh, prime minister narendra modi has traveled with to africa the same round i want to look at the fact that of course governments in africa come and go but the private sector will always stay is this an area that uh, as the federation back in india you're looking at exploiting especially in terms of engagement with the private sector in rwanda for a long term 
Yes, I think private sector to private sector can usually be a lot more innovative. But what we have seen is even the, a lot of the public sector companies in India and a lot of public sector companies in Rwanda can also be a catalyst for that. But on a long term basis, I think eventually the private sector has the, cap has the capital, has the capability, has the entrepreneurial instincts to exploit new opportunities. And we as FICI want to make sure there is a lot more interaction, a lot more give and take between Indian companies and African companies, especially Rwandan companies in terms of looking at opportunities, whether it's in information technology, whether it's in agri-good, whether it's in infrastructure, I think eventually even in financial services. Uh, I've been here, I've been studying uh, this country for, for the last few weeks and I think the opportunity in financial services in Rwanda itself is very big and India as you know in the last few years has gone through a big revolution in financial services and we think a lot of that can be also uh, you know, imported out here. Now, of course, India has tra traded a lot with East Africa and South Africa, uh, but we understand at this time, you know, as Africa is also uniting, they just signed a continental free trade agreement, you know, bringing together and a big market, about two billion people, which will even be bigger than India in this particular case. Um, I want to understand your strategy, especially into penetrating the Francophone Africa. Yeah, uh, as you rightly said, I think for Indian companies, the English speaking Africa has been an easier one and especially more on the eastern side of Africa because that's also geographically closer to us. And the historic ties with East Africa have been stronger than with other parts of Africa. So East and South Africa are the more easier ports of call in that sense. And uh, a, lo a lot of them which are English speaking are makes it a lot easier because India, Indian companies are more comfortable with English. But I think over the years now we are seeing that the Francophone company uh, countries uh, are also becoming closer to India and uh, the kind of opportunities that are coming up are a lot more. I think the good news on this is that Africa is shifting away from a lot of individual small countries to one big economic block and as you said the East African block and the other as Africa becomes more and more large in size and more homogeneous in that sense from a trade and investment point of view it will be easier for Indian countries to, uh, to invest out here because eventually, and that is what I was saying earlier, a lot of Indian companies see Rwanda as not just only for the Rwandan market but for a gateway to Africa. Rwanda is a gateway to East Africa for sure but it can be a gateway to a larger Africa also. Interesting conversation. I actually uh, want to take a short break but I want us when we come back to talk about um, the fact that you know our similarities in terms of a growing population but also historically and some of the lessons we can pick especially in terms of trade and investment. Now we take a very short break but when we come back understanding you know what uh, best lessons Africa can draw from India especially that we have the same history but also a growing population Population. We'll be back in just a few minutes. Welcome back and you're still watching this special with the President of the Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Mr. Rashid Shah. So um, I want us to move on to something else. Now, you mentioned earlier on that India is doing a lot in terms of financial services, but also doing lots of projects across Africa. Where are these, where is India focusing a lot and in which countries and what type of products or services are we seeing India bringing into Africa? So, so if you see Indian companies when they uh, go out to invest, as I said, Indian companies are also moving away from just trade to making investments outside because India has also got investment surplus because we have a fairly high amount of capital available in India. Uh, part of that is happening through Exim Bank of India is giving credit lines to various countries including in East Africa. Uh, earlier Indian companies went out in search for raw material. After that, Indian companies went out in search for expertise and technology and brand names. But now a lot of Indian companies are going out in search for market access, large markets. And I think in that, in the third context, is where the African, East African opportunity is very large. Because I think the way 
uh, this part of the world is growing the kind of opportunity for both investment and for consumption oriented uh, uh, industries is huge so indian companies are investing from infrastructure we have seen on this trip itself lot of projects which are infrastructure led to investment in it parks and real estate uh, a lot of investments are happening a lot of investments are happening in agro processing into converting agriculture output into value added processing for exports to other markets so i think these are the areas now where indian companies are investing a lot these are also the areas where indian companies have the expertise because india itself has gone through an infrastructure investment phase we are going through a rapid infrastructure investment phase we have gone through a lot of uh, you know investments in agro processing the last area which i saw on this trip itself where a lot of indian companies are investing is in fintech financial technology uh, including using data and loans and micro loans and all of that so i think there is a lot of excitement in old opportunities and new opportunities, opportunities. Also. um uh, good that you mentioned about value addition because that brings me to my next question that by 2025 two thirds of africa's population would be uh, like middle class with well paying jobs they'll be needing infrastructure skills training and access to education now th this means that also africa moves to a more people centered kind of solution meaning we have to move into the fourth industrial revolution you know industrialization how is india coming into the picture to help in this particular area so india is going through its own phase of the fourth industrial revolution so if you see the world at large i think what happened in countries like usa about 40 years ago uh, happened in countries like china 20 years ago india is about 14 15 years behind china and i think africa is about 14 15 years behind india in the same evolutionary cycle and whether we talk about converting you know raw material into value added goods whether we talk about the growth of the middle class and the consumption opportunities for everything from media entertainment to you know uh, your appliances and white goods and all i see india is growing the way china grew 10 to 15 years ago africa is going to grow the way india is growing now 10 to 15 years from now so like for example around 2005 is when india's the middle class really came of age and a lot of the momentum in india that we are seeing is this growth of the middle class in india i think africa is going to see the same thing it is seeing the same thing with the young population growth of middle class more jobs more disposable income uh, africa is going to see something very similar to that so i think there are learnings out there companies who have done this in india in terms of investment in terms of you know exploiting this trends can come to africa and actually do the same thing now you know for africa being attractive to emerging powers like india china japan everything is quite exciting but you know in this case this comes with a couple of uh, constraints and i want to look at this in terms of the fact that you've been leading uh, the chamber of commerce in india speaking to different investors from india you know coming into africa to invest massively what have been some of the constraints that you feel like need to be improved for this kind of relationships to progress i think first and all uh, first and foremost because a lot of these opportunities indian companies have to take a 20 year 25 year view if you're investing in a rail line between say rwanda and tanzania you need to take a 20 25 year view so the stability the security of the investments all of those are very important i think in the last 10 15 years a large part of africa especially east africa has shown that there is stability and progress and and you know uh, uh, the, the rule of law prevails I think that is giving more and more comfort but the, but the first and most important is the is the stability of the regime the stability of the economic policies like you know the tax breaks that have been given all of that should stay so if there is a lot of uncertainty around that it does hold back investments the other one is the overall safety of the people and all even in that I think a lot of countries in east africa especially countries in rwanda have done very well the third is good quality of uh, you know a life people want because if indians are going to come here make investment stay here live here they want to be able to you know uh, have a good quality of life which is also happening i think uh, when i see what is available in kenya and uganda and rwanda 
I think it's phenomenal and South Africa. So I think all these areas, but not all countries are equally safe, not all countries are equally stable. So I think as this grows in the in the region, investment will happen faster and faster. But I think uh, A, the opportunity attracts people, but to convert that attraction into actual investment, along with the opportunity, you also need safety, security, predictability over the long term. And that is very important for every investor in the world, whether they are Indian investors or any other investors. I, I have to definitely touch on this because throughout the conversation, we, we've talked about products and services, you know, and you've come off saying Indian companies are investing in this, putting up stores, putting up this. Now, in the past, especially in East Africa, we've seen a lot retail, a lot of it retail investments from India into the African continent. Now, looking in the, into the broader picture of building massive infrastructure, putting up, you know, do we see India move from uh, retail investments to other bigger projects? Absolutely. I think the two attractive opportunities in Africa, one is investments in infrastructure, real estate, basically investments which will develop the backbone of Africa. Yeah. And the other is the consumption opportunities where retail and other areas. And I think in the consumption part, there is a lot more that will be done including, as I said, in financial services, in media and entertainment, we have not seen that yet happening. But I'm pretty sure in the next few years, we will also see Indian companies from those sectors. Indian companies that operate, say, malls and multiplexes will come out here and make investments. So I think consumption opportunity is just starting off. Investment opportunity is a lot clearer from infrastructure and other points of view. So I think both of them, given the, as I keep on saying, the historic ties there are a lot of indians out here and indians have lived here for many many years have gone through the you know ups and downs of africa's story but the roots are very deep and given those deep roots we and the fact that we are currently at that inflection point where we are moving away from trade only to trade and investment is a very exciting phase. Quite an interesting point, especially moving, the f the being the fact that Africa is on the same you know, path, growing population. India is about 1.5 billion now. Africa in the next few years is 50, 2050, we are expected to be uh, double the population of India and China, which is really going to be crazy. Now, we're looking at the continent also, you know, getting onto the global stage for competition, you know, and, and, and being out there global in terms of trade and investments. Just give us um, some best practices we can draw from India's journey, especially now seeing India coming out, you know, uh, to take on the global stage. I think uh, there are four or five uh, things India has done well, that have happened in India well. One is generating our own capital, a lot of savings. So India, Indian savings are 30% of GDP. So we generate a lot of our capital for investments also because you need to save money which you could invest, which develops the country even further. So though we get foreign investment also, a lot of our investments come from our own domestic savings. So I think having a large savings pool across Africa uh, is going to be, if it is there, will be a big plus because that will fast forward the investment and the growth phase because being only dependent on foreign capital is has a lot of constraints. The other is governance and rule of law and the progressive practices which a lot of African countries have shown in the last 10-15 years can be done very well, as good as anywhere else in the world. But I think that as it spreads to more and more countries in Africa is also going to be a prerequisite to this economic boom that we are all anticipating in Africa. The third along with that is investment in skills and education because if you have such a large population, it can be either a, you know an advantage or a disadvantage. It becomes an advantage when that population can be productively employed. So to create opportunities for them and for order to create opportunities, they need to have skills, they need to have education, they need to have, be able to and skills are getting very dynamic in the world. The world is changing, so skills are also not static. The skills you have today may not be as valuable five years down the line. So I think this ability to invest in skills in education is also going to be very, very important. And the fourth is a business friendly environment, ease of doing business, uh, you know, I think ability to get approvals and all quickly. So I think ease of doing business, having good skilled workforce, having stability, rule of law, governance, part of it, and having a good capital base. I think these are the few things India has done well, 
So we ourselves have a long way to go and we are still in that journey but there are a lot of similarities and parallels you can draw from there as you chart out the, the economic boom that is underway in Africa. Thank you so much, Mr. Rashish, for having time to speak to CNN. Thanks a lot, Maggie. Okay. Fabulous. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of this conversation on the India-Africa relations. As the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Bodhi continues his trip across Africa to deepen ties between the 54 African countries and India. My name is Maggie Motisi and keep it CNBC Africa.